Most people recognize Frogger as an arcade game from the 1980s. It was the kind of game that was simple yet effective, appealing to a wide range of demographics and widely impacting popular culture. But Frogger has also had a life beyond the 80s arcade that is worth talking about too. After a well-received home console sequel in 1984 called Frogger 2 3 Deep, the Frogger series lay dormant for over a decade until 1997, when a third game, simply called Frogger again, was released for the PS1 and PC. It had the words, he's back, ominously written on the cover, and for that reason fans generally call it Frogger He's Back to differentiate it from the original. This game served as a modern, at the time, reboot of the Frogger franchise, and while it didn't make as much of a cultural impact as the original, it did become a PlayStation bestseller and spawned its own sequel called Frogger 2 Swampy's Revenge. Over time, these games have grown a niche but strong cult following, especially over the past decade as people who grew up playing the games have come of age and started wanting to expand and preserve those experiences. As part of the preservation effort, one of the more prominent members of the Frogger community, known as KneeSnap, managed to uncover a 50 gigabyte backup of development materials for Swampy's Revenge. But a problem immediately arose. The backup was not on a hard drive or CD or any other widely used medium that could have been dumped in an afternoon. Instead, it was on a rare, obscure, and proprietary magnetic tape format known as OnStream. Why did they use this, and what would it take to get the data off it? All that and more after a message from our sponsor. PCBWay is your one-stop shop for making just about anything electronic. They make PCBs, obviously, but they also do plastic injection molding, metal machining, and can even assemble the whole thing for you. They recently invited me to tour their factory, and it is massive. The amount of work and expertise here is absolutely insane, but the results speak for themselves. You really can get an entire gadget created here, and for some upcoming projects of mine, I wouldn't choose anyone else. Be sure to check them out at PCBWay.com. And now, back to Frogger. While not as widely used today, tape was and still is the lowest cost medium for storing large amounts of data, and OnStream's 50GB tape was particularly good value in the late 90s and early 2000s. Unfortunately, this didn't end up translating into business success, with OnStream filing for bankruptcy not once, but twice, and bowing completely out of the tape storage industry by 2003. Their relatively low usage and short time on the market has made these tapes particularly challenging to work with. Documentation and resources are limited, and drives that still work, especially ones that support the 50GB format, are few and far between. Luckily, OnStream's tapes are known for their longevity, and this tape indeed appeared to be in good condition. So Neesnat was pretty confident he could recover most, if not all, of the data, if only he could find a compatible drive. Thankfully, determining which drive he needed was easy because the developers wrote it on the label, and he was even able to find one for sale online. Score! But when he got it and put the tape in, it turned out the drive was broken. It would make some noise, blink some lights, and then eject the tape. Opening it up, he confirmed that the rubber pinch roller had melted. He made some attempts to repair it himself to no avail, so eventually he opted to try finding a replacement drive instead. But like I said, these things are rare, and Neesnap struggled to find a second SC50. So eventually he decided to try what seemed like the next best thing, another on-stream drive called the ADR50E, which was advertised as being compatible with 50GB tapes. Thankfully this drive actually worked, and he was able to fully confirm its operation using some test tapes as well as another tape used for a different game by the same developer. Except the Frogger tape still wouldn't read. The drive would just spit out a generic error without even attempting to read the tape. What gives? Well, considering the drive seemed to be fully functional with the other tapes, Neesnap eventually concluded that the tape must actually be damaged. Assuming there was nothing more he could do, he found a data recovery company with good reviews that specifically advertised services for on-stream data tapes. He got in touch with the general manager, who even implied they had their own proprietary machine that could be configured to read any tape. So he sent the tape over, assuming if anyone could recover the data, it'd be these guys. What could possibly go wrong? As it turns out, absolutely everything. While the company claimed they could get the tape recovered and back to him in a week, they ended up holding onto it for about a month, providing vague and infrequent communications about the state of the recovery, even when Neesnap asks detailed technical questions. During this time, Neesnap had continued to research the tape format and discovered that while the ADR50E was compatible with 50GB tapes, it was only compatible with tapes that were written by other ADR50Es, not tapes written with SC50s. Realizing that the tape may not actually be broken, and that the company didn't seem to be making any progress with it, he asked for the tape to be sent back. The company did oblige and assured him it will perform the way it did when we received it. It turns out that was a complete, utter lie. The tape knee snap got back had been inexplicably ripped and spliced back together in several places. Not only were they unable to recover any data from it, they may have made the tape even less recoverable than it was before. 
In hindsight, Neesnap believes that they never had the capability of recovering on-stream tapes. OnStream had a lot of custom hardware designed from scratch that was never used or shared with any other tape manufacturer. It would be very unlikely for this custom machine of theirs to be compatible with them without an enormously expensive cloning effort, particularly since, as we know, many OnStream tapes weren't even compatible with each other. And had they had a real SC50 drive, which Neesnap had hoped since they specifically advertised on-stream support on their website, they would have been able to read the tape with any version of the Linux kernel from the last 10 to 20 years. The only silver lining was that the company had a no recovery, no charge policy, so he didn't have to pay for them ruining what used to be a good condition tape. But still, this was devastating. Likely, the only remaining copy of this data was now teetering on the edge of being lost forever. Eventually, Neesnap managed to obtain another SC50 drive that actually worked, but sadly his worst fears proved true as the drive struggled to read the Frankenstein tape. When inserting a tape, the drive reads special reserved parts of it for information, like what kind of tape is inserted, what parts of the tape have factory defects, and only after this process is complete does the drive actually respond to any requests from the computer. Some of these crucial parts were in areas that the recovery company had spliced together, and they were rendered completely unreadable so the drive would never finish its initialization phase. Indeed, it seemed like the data might be gone for good. But Neesnap wasn't about to let that happen without a fight. He spent months researching the drive, reverse engineering its firmware, studying its command interface, reading documentation, digging up patents, anything that had a chance of getting the drive to read something from this tape. But the first breakthrough came with a surprisingly simple realization. If the drive is getting stuck in the initialization process, could we just skip it by inserting an undamaged tape and letting the drive complete its initialization, and then spoofing the drive's eject sensors so the tape could be replaced without it knowing, we could basically trick the drive into reading from the damaged backup. Using this trick, the first real chunks of data were finally extracted from the tape. But unfortunately, getting the data was only half the battle. It turns out there was no standard format for writing data to these tapes, so each backup program did it in its own proprietary way. While researching, Neesnap determined that the tape was written with a program called ArcServe2000, and you'd think he could just acquire a copy of that and decode the data with it, but no. ArcServe2000 stores a catalog of crucial metadata necessary to read the tape back both on the PC that wrote the tape and on the tape itself, but due to what seems to be a bug, it just fails to read the catalog off SC50 tapes. If you happen to be using the PC that wrote the tape originally, then it uses the one stored on the PC and reads fine, but obviously Neesnap didn't have access to the PC that wrote this one, so the tape was effectively unreadable by ArcServe even if it hadn't been damaged. This was hopeless, so Neesnap decided to ditch ArcServe completely. With the open source tape driver in the Linux kernel, he was able to make a raw dump of the whole tape, and then he wrote a tool to actually parse the files out of the ArcServe format. Thankfully, it wasn't very complicated and he figured it out pretty quickly, but then he noticed many of the large files extracted by his tool were corrupted, more than would be expected from the physical damage to the tape. It turns out ArcServe also regularly used an undocumented mode in the on-stream drive. This mode completely changed the physical pattern in which data was written to the tape, and reading it back without that mode meant the data would be all out of order. Neesnap had to reverse engineer the layout of this new data and heavily modify both the tool and the tape driver to dump the data in the way it was intended to be read. But even after doing that, there was still some lingering file corruption that couldn't be explained. Thankfully, it didn't take long to realize that there was a section of the tape that the on-stream standard stated no user data can be recorded. And it turned out ArcServe recorded data there anyway, because ArcServe sucks. So he had to modify the driver again to not skip the area where no user data can be recorded. And finally, after months of reverse engineering ArcServe, the drive firmware, and just about everything else related to on-stream magnetic tape storage, his program worked, and against all of the odds, the data was saved. The most important files, including the source code repository, final game assets, and development tools were all fully intact, but sadly, due to the damage caused by the data recovery company, it was not a 100% backup. About 5%, or around a couple thousand files, could not be recovered, and while at first that sounds pretty bad, thanks to extreme luck, nearly all of the damaged files were either duplicated on other parts of the tape, or found on other backup CDs that the community had acquired too. Only 15 files were lost for good, and out of all of those, only one was noteworthy, a CD image of a PC build from one month after release. 
58,149 files were fully recovered out of 58,164. And while we could mourn the loss of those few files, that's still a 99.9% .9 recovery snatched from the jaws of defeat. No matter which way you look at it, that's unquestionably a success. Neesnap published the source code for his ArcServe dumping utility in case anyone finds themselves in a similar situation, as well as all of the data on the tape onto GitHub. If you're interested in more frog and modding, check out the Highway Frogs forum and Discord server. They're always looking for more people interested in keeping Frogger alive, and Neesnap is especially interested in hearing from people who'd like to try making custom levels for Frogger 1. If any of this sounds interesting to you, links are in the description. Even though Frogger wasn't a part of my childhood, I always love hearing stories about preservation against all the odds. It just goes to show that even in the face of certain doom, oftentimes all it takes is a little bit of skill and a lot of perseverance to make the impossible possible. Also, what the hell was going on with tape standards in the late 90s? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the story too, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.